before commencing the account of Empress Marie Louise's journey to Vienna, I must revert to the state of things in Italy. In consequence of the desertion of the King of Naples, the Viceroy of Italy had concentrated his for forces on the Mincio and had established his headquarters at Mantua. The Vice Queen had joined him there and gave birth on April 13th to her fifth child. When the Vice Queen left Milan, a coterie was already secretly agitating against French domination. General Pino, who had been Minister of War, abandoned the French cause at the same time. The Austrian general, Neipperg, who was three months previously, had signed the treaty against France with the Neapolitan Minister of Foreign Affairs, presented himself at Prince Eugène's headquarters, accompanied by the Count de Wartenberg, aide-de-camp to the Count of Bavaria. This officer carried a letter from the king inviting his son-in-law to abandon so desperate a cause and to follow his own example. General Neipperg also acquainted the Viceroy of the occupation of Paris by the Allied troops and of the dethronement of the Emperor. Prince Eugène answered these communications with these noble words. I understand nothing about politics, but simple good sense in default of every other feeling shows that the only thing to be done under these circumstances is to unite the French and Austrian forces and to march upon Paris, there to protect the rights of Marie-Louise and of her son. Such were certainly not the intentions of General Neipperg. On the morrow, the 17th, Prince Eugène concluded a convention with Marshal Bellegarde for the return of the French troops to their country. Whilst these things were going on, news of the Treaty of Fontainebleau arrived, a treaty by which Napoleon abandoned all his claims to Italy. This was followed by the news of his abdication. These two pieces of news excited terrible fermentation in the peninsula, on April 20th, an insurrection broke out in Milan in the course of which Prina, Minister of Finance, was killed with umbrella blows. Prince Eugène's position in Italy was not long tenable. On April 25th, he left Mantua with the Vice Queen, who had hardly recovered from her confinement and proceeded by way of Verona to Munich. There he found letters from his mother, which called him away, and having left his wife in Munich, he proceeded immediately to Paris. On April 25th, the Empress Marie Louise, who had been styled Duchess of Parma, but who continued to wear her first title, received the farewell of her father, who was returning to Paris to dine at the house of the Count d'Artois, and then proceeded on her journey, which was not to be interrupted any more. Marie-Louise was accompanied by Madame de Montebello and Brignol, by General Caffarelli, by Barons de saint aignan Bausset, and myself. The Prince of Parma, who had lost the title of King of Rome, was accompanied by his noble and faithful governess, Madame de Montesquieu, who had refused to separate herself from him, and by Madame Soufflot. We traveled under the guard of the Austrian general, Count Kinski, and his staff on the way from Grosbois to Provence. We passed Austrian and Cossack camps. The country presented a desolate aspect. Swarms of horses let loose in the fields were destroying all hopes of a harvest. The empress wrote to the emperor from Provence. I posted her letter and mine at Provence to the care of General Bertrand. These letters reached their destination and were received at Porto Ferreo on May 25th following. We saw the same spectacle of devastation on the way from Paris to Troy, which had saddened our departure from Gros Bois. The country ravaged, villages burned, and the little village of Nogent. Nothing but a heap of ruins. There were not two houses standing intact. Brick chimneys alone were standing. The Empress lodged in Troy at the house of Monsieur de Mesgrigny father of the emperor's equerry and the father-in-law of the under governess of the king of rome we arrived at dijon on the evening of the 28th after having slept at chatillon the city of sinister memories general julet military governor of the district general Fresnel and several other austrian generals and superior officers received their master's daughter all the Austrian troops were under arms and lined the streets of Dijon. General Julet 
had given orders that the cannon should be fired and the city be illuminated. Fortunately, the empress, informed in time, was able to escape this surfeit of untimely homages. The Austrians affected to pay great honor to their sovereign's daughter. It was to the Archduchess and not to the Empress that these manifestations of deference and respect were addressed. Marie Louise arrived in Baal, escorted by a detachment of Swiss cavalry, which received her at the frontier, and she entered into the city between rows of Austrian and Bavarian troops. The house which she occupied had been inhabited by the Emperor of Austria. Care had been taken to prepare her lodgings all the way in the same houses where her father had lived, fearing lest the journey might tire her son and anxious to escape the importunate marks of respect which she was pursued. Marie Louise decided to rest a day in Baal. The courier whom the Empress had dispatched from Rambouillet to Fontainebleau brought her back a letter from Napoleon dated from Fréjou on April 28th. The emperor had embarked for the island of Elba the same day as saint Raphael. I received the same courier two letters from General Bertrand, also dated the 28th. These letters aroused in Marie-Louise's heart regret for not having joined the emperor in Fontainebleau. It was a secret sorrow, a kind of remorse which often manifested itself in spite of the efforts which she made to hide her feelings. In view of the picturesque sights and the various sights afforded to the eyes by a journey through Switzerland were not sufficient to divert her from this preoccupation. At Schaffhausen, the Empress saw the falls of the Rhine under their various aspects. In Zurich, she rode out on the lake, Monsieur de Lebzeltern, the Austrian chargé d'affaires, and the Diet during the absence of the ambassador asked to be presented to her with the representatives of Russia, Bavaria, and other members of the diplomatic corps. But Marie-Louise refused to receive them, alleging her incognito as a reason of this refusal. She stayed 24 hours at Constance, made an excursion on the lake, and paid a visit to the island of Mainau at Waldsee. She lodged at the chateau of the prince who presented his wife, who was about to be confined of her 17th child, and his daughter, Canoness, of a chapter in Salzburg to the empress. Marie-Louise's melancholy had increased during her sad journey through our desolated provinces and the Austrian states. Her nights were disturbed by painful fits of sleeplessness, and her face was often steeped in tears. After one of these sleepless nights, one day in the tea roll, she said to me with tears in her eyes that she had lacked in resolution in blah, and that no reason ought to have delayed her departure for Fontainebleau, a praiseworthy but useless regret, which time perhaps has not altogether effaced the guides which the Emperor Francis solicitude had given to his daughter, faithful to their instructions, neglected nothing to awaken in Marie Louise's mind the remembrance of her German fatherland. In France, and as far as the Swiss frontier, they had surrounded her, as we have related, with homage and honors. But when this princess entered Tyrol, the demonstrations of popular enthusiasm knew no limits. At Fusen, at Reidy, at Innsbruck, and as far as Salzburg, the delirium was universal. The inhabitants of the villages rushed in crowds to see the daughter of their well-beloved sovereign go by. Songs were heard all along the road, echoed by troops of singers placed for the purpose some distance away. The Tyrolians excel in open-air concerts performed with instruments. At Fusen, mortars were fired at Righty. No sooner had the Empress's carriage been seen from afar than 20 Tyrolians carrying ropes rushed to meet it, unyoked the horses, and dragged it to her house. During dinner, a troop of men and women sang verses in her praise outside her windows. On the morrow at 7 o'clock, a capuchin monk, followed by two or three young people, entered the passage, which led to the princess's apartment and sang a number of songs with his companions before for the door of her chamber. Snow had been falling all the morning, but this did not slacken the ardor of the Tyrolians. All the way from Reidy to Innsbruck, the inhabitants of all the villages were under arms, singing national anthems and chorus, saluting with flags and firing off mortars. As soon as they saw the carriages, they saw in the Empress 
an Austrian princess only. Perhaps not one of these men who indulged in such noisy joy knew that she had reigned over France as the wife of Emperor Napoleon. At Innsbruck, where she arrived at eight in the evening, she found the city illuminated. She was received there with the same transports, and her carriage was dragged, or rather carried, to the chateau where she alighted. The crowd was so great that two men and a child were crushed to death at the gates of the town. The Bavarian functionaries were awaiting the empress at the foot of the grand staircase of the chateau and seemed to place themselves under her protection. The poor Bavarians, who held public offices in Tyrol, were dying to get away, considering that their lives were not safe in the midst of this popular excitement. Their authority, however, was exercised in a moderate and liberal manner. The vivacity of the attachment of the Tyrolians for the House of Austria, which had been still further excited by the pretense of showing them a princess of this house, was a warning given to Bavaria not to think of keeping the provinces in which this affection and a hatred for foreigners had such deep roots. Tyrol was accordingly given back to Austria one month later from Innsbruck where she stayed two days. Marie-Louise proceeded to Salzburg. The marshal of the court of the royal prince of Bavaria awaited her at the door of the chateau, where she alighted. She was visited there by the Princess Royale, a very handsome woman, at that time about 20 years old, and she returned this visit on the following day at the chateau de Mirabelle, where this princess lived. All these royal or princely residences were large and spacious. The young prince entrusted to the care of Madame de Montesquieu only saw his mother at the places where she stopped. He had forgotten the grief with which he had left the Tuileries. The novelty of what he saw amused him and he enjoyed it all in the happy carelessness of childhood. Having rested a day at Salzburg, the empress continued her journey to Vienna by way of Milk. Prince Traumensdorf, Grand Equerry, came to receive her there and to ask in the name of the Empress of Austria, who was coming to meet her, by what road she proposed to travel. She met the Empress of Austria between St. Polten and Siegartskirchen. At a distance of four leagues from Vienna, the Empress of Austria gave up her carriage to Madame de Montebello and Countess Lazansky, former mistress of the Archduchess Marie Louise, and entered the latter's carriage. The same evening, the Empress arrived in Schönbrunn, the destination of her journey. The princes of her family, uncles and brothers, had come there from Vienna to receive her. Her sisters were awaiting her at the door of the apartment to which she was conducted, by the Empress of Austria, the young archduchesses threw themselves in her neck as though she had just escaped from some danger, and they were glad to see her safe and sound. Marie Louise had returned to Vienna in about the same position as when she had left it four or five years previously, with bitter remembrances to boot, fallen from the lofty rank which the policy of the Austrian cabinet had temporarily bestowed on her and decoyed with the enjoyment of a principality which she was to purchase with the most painful sacrifices. When she had been destined to become Napoleon's wife, her father, the emperor, had said in taking leave of her, be a good wife, a good mother, and render yourself agreeable in everything to your husband. Austrian politics had mentally added, as long as he is powerful, happy, and useful to our house, Marie Louise, on the throne on which Napoleon's choice and the eager consent of her father had placed her, had docilely obeyed her father's orders. There had never been anything to blame in her conduct as a wife. If it had been the destiny of the emperor to survive its disasters, she would have left behind an honored memory after having given the example of private virtues equal to those of the wife of Louis the Fourteenth or the wife of Louis the Fifteenth. As empress, either from self-love or from a sense of duty, she had seemed to take pride in the prosperities of the empire. She had not shown herself indifferent to our misfortunes. She tolerated no machinations against the safety and the repose of France, in the days which preceded its agony, she was the zealous and straightforward intermediary between the emperor and her husband. But she had never identified herself with her adopted country. Passive, 
a stranger to politics, contemplating with terror the sight so new to her of party struggles, not having resided in France long enough to contract ties of any strength there. She did not take in our misfortunes, that active and passionate part which induced Anne of Austria and Marie Antoinette to make the cause of the country in times of trouble and danger their personal causes. She had renounced her new country without much opposition to take refuge in her family as a harbor where she would be sheltered from new storms. Imbued with the impression which she had received in early youth, with the idea that the interest of the House of Austria cannot be weighed in the balance with any other interest. When her father said to her in Schönbrunn after her return, as my daughter, all I have is yours, even my blood and my life. As a sovereign, I do not know you. She could but bow her head and confirm the irresistible force of such an argument by her silence. This saying of the Emperor Francis would justify the popular prejudice which attributes to the Austrian princesses a fatal influence on the destinies of France. Marie Louise's family received her with all the outward signs of cordiality. The Empress of Austria and other archduchesses had come to reside in the palace of Schönbrunn to receive her, to live with her. During the first days, numerous visits were exchanged among these princes and princesses, and interminable conversations were indulged in. The empress divided the rest of her time between her son, whose apartment adjoined her own, and the French persons who had accompanied her during her journey, but who were to leave her after a short stay. Comte de Lobau who had been kept a prisoner in spite of the capitulation of Dresden, came to Schönbrunn and spent two days there before continuing his journey to Paris. He left on June 29th. The 30th was the date fixed for the departure of the Duchess de Montebello. This separation, which was extremely painful to the Empress, was tempered only by the hope of seeing the Duchess again in the spring of X. Madame. Messieurs de Saint-Aignan and Corvassar, who left with the Duchess de Montebello, also took leave. On the morrow, General Caffarelli, in his turn, left for France. These successive departures revived the pain which the Empress felt in losing persons whose fidelity and devotion she had been able to appreciate. She handed the noble and loyal Caffarelli a small Morocco pocketbook which she had used and wrote some friendly words on the first page. On the day after Marie Louise's arrival at Schönbrunn, she settled the order of service of her household, but no particular regulations were let, laid down. She even wanted to banish all etiquette and realize her pet dream of a private life. She refused to live in common with her family and preserved her domestic independence. She used to lunch and dine at her usual hours at 11 in the morning and 7 in the evening with Countess Brignol, Monsieur de Bausset, and myself, who alone remained with her. She used to invite, in turn, a small number of persons of her family, ministers, and their wives, gentlemen and ladies of the Emperor of Austria's household, and certain persons holding high rank or dignities in the state. The reception accorded to us in this court differed for each of us, but we were not treated as friends. Generally speaking, we had reason neither to complain of nor to praise the reception which was given to us. 